talk to a panel of four people that we invited in from various disciplines across campus. And I encourage you to think of questions that you want to ask them. We're going to start off with a five minute introduction for each of them um, and how they deal with empathy and humility in their classroom and how they foster it. And then um, we'll be running around with questions, uh, microphone, to be asked questions again. Okay? So, Leslie. Observations, questions, and paying attention. Yep. Thank you. All right. Gordon. Great. So I'm Maureen Grinsbucker, and I'm a bias professor. I'm a Sir Frederick Bartlett professor in psychology in my area of cognitive neuroscience, and I study communication and attention in critically evolving people and atypically developing people, and their standard context, and then most recently in electronic and mobile context. Um, I've been faculty here at CWE for over 25 years, and then before that, I was on the faculty at the University of Oregon for 10 years. And I grew up in Texas, and I used to teach uh, and did for five years taught public high school in Texas. And also for several years, I chaired the UW Committee on Access and Accommodation and Instruction. And that's the perspective I'll be talking about today. Um, I usually travel, and I've seen my home and I usually travel with an infographic, and some of you. Uh, I've seen my um, <coughs> before, and I was out with Marisha 
Um, uh, and there should be one on everybody's table, at least one or two. And um, you know, the only important or that the point that you get more important, but the key piece that I want to talk about uh, today is that um, we know that 7% of our UW students at all levels of, of study and in all departments and in all colleges um, identify as a person with a disability. But we also know that most of us who are instructors and instructional staff and faculty think that we only come into contact with about half that number or percentage of students. And so one of the questions that I'm interested in is why we aren't aware of the actual number of disabled students on this campus. And one hypothesis is that many disabilities are so-called invisible or less visible disabilities. And we, in fact, tend to think we can see that on the infographic. We tend to overestimate the number of persons or students um, with mobility disabilities wheelchair users or use um, other mobility devices, and we underestimate the number of individuals with um, chronic health conditions or psychiatric disabilities like anxiety and depression. But another hypothesis on this campus might be that we tend to only think a student has a disability if they have a McMurphy visa, and, um, and if they present that visa to us. But the reality is that our UW faculty policies and procedures and the American with Disabilities Act do not require us to have students register with the McBurney Center. The McBurney Center is called the Resource Center in the same way that the Writing Center or even the, the Teaching Academy is a Resource Center. And then we know that only about half of the students with a disability um, will register with McBurney. And I've become pretty interested in trying to figure out well, why that is. So one of the pieces that gave me more insight, hopefully empathy, definitely humility, was following a recent hashtag on Twitter that was hashtag everyday academic ableism. And ableism you can probably figure out is like sexism or racism. And so I thought I would read a few of those um, tweets. Hashtag, everyday academic ableism is having to get ridiculous amounts of thorough evidence just to get support. The processes of getting these pieces of evidence can be incredibly tiring and difficult. This, the meetings, emails, explaining the same thing over and over, the doctor visits, phone calls, mental health appointments, just to get, quote unquote, evidence. Hashtag, everyday academic ableism in action. Honestly, the amount of documentation needed to get accommodations can be considered. Hashtag everyday academic ableism. Hashtag everyday academic ableism is waking up with a migraine the morning of your final exam, lying down in a public toilet on your way to a trial until your vision is done, arriving 20 minutes late and still taking the exam because you can't chance trying to get a doctor's note for your migraine. Hashtag everyday academic ableism is participation in a large portion of your grade. So if you have a condition that makes it difficult for you to speak, or you miss class due to flare-ups, you're automatically losing points from the start. Hashtag academic ableism is being told, quote, writing notes by hand instead of typing is more effective for retaining information. No laptops in class that are distracting. Attendance and verbal and social participation will be checked and graded. Hashtag, uh, Oh, sorry, I should say instructors also joined into the hashtag, and so I'll end with just a couple of their, their tweets. As educators, we can all do better to provide and support our students equal access to education, even if, in fact, especially if in the absence of documentation. Hashtag academic ableism. Um, and actually from another John Martin, and this tweeter identifies as John D. Martin III, son of John D. Martin Jr. So I don't think that's our John Martin, but it's a, it's a good quote nonetheless. It could be from our John Martin. Let's also remember that you, the instructor, have power to be a human being. One, work with students to accommodate disability, and two, you don't need to have documentation in order to be a human being. Hashtag academic. So one of the 
things when we get through uh, the introduction that I want to come back and think about what are the ways that we can build into our course these sort of empathetic cues or opportunities to sort of systemically build in a little bit of leniency and such. Uh, thank you. Mike. Hello, everybody. Um, I want to engage talk about this is where it's. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Mike Jacoby. I'm the tier coordinator on the athletic department in the academic services department. Um, very excited to be here. I'm very, very humble. Um, my experience is pretty a little different uh, than uh, in teaching. So I got my master's in writing. Before that, I studied English and psychology. Uh, and so um, I feel like the assumption is we're here so much for athletics and love sports. And nothing is further from the truth for me. I can't emphasize that enough. I don't care about sports. Um, <laughs> I really don't. Uh, but it's just a practice and empathy for me because every day I am working among a really ton of people who have, like, that's just their jam, right? That's what they think about on the check in the morning. And I'm, you know, constantly having to stretch my imagination to uh, to see what that would be like. Um, because I don't experience that in the first school of my brothers for years. Um, so anyway, my background, I started out as a English teacher my senior year in my undergrad. And uh, got a lot of practice just from that. Um, I worked with a instructor and I tutored for 13 students in an intensive writing course. Um, so I saw every student in the class and I learned really quickly that they don't love what I love, which is English and writing and anything that's put on paper, uh, which I just you know, cared a lot about and they didn't. That was something that they didn't like a lot. A lot of those students were ESL students, which was really great experience for me because I got to see what it was like. Um, them being in a new area, you know, totally new environment, and doing things with the language that I can never do, English is my only real language. Um, so I got a lot of pra uh, practice right then and there, imagining other people's perspectives. And then um, after that, I was asked by that instructor if I would uh, coordinate the uh, writing center for her as a um, grad assistant for my master's program. So I did that for two years, and I got some experience training tutors then and teaching tutors. And then I came here, and I've been. Uh, Hiring tutors, teaching them. Um, I'm sure the students would probably know some of my tutors are sure from PE and uh, and uh, I'm excited to interview them every semester. Uh, so what I do in the tutor uh, in the tutor program there is um, support our 500 athletes. No, well, there's about 500 who use the program every year, um, every semester. Right now I have 400 requests for tutors in my inbox. Uh, it's a very special time of year for me um, and my tutors getting excited about that because I'm you know, working a lot with them right now getting them ready as a tutor. Um, and so I was actually asked to be here by one of my tutors um, who has come to a lot of my workshops. Uh, Deborah's over there. Um, she comes to a lot of those, which I always appreciate because I write those myself and uh, work to make sure my tutors are always working on not just professional development but growing as tutors. Uh, that's something that's really vital to me. Um, I was asked if I wanted a picture up here, and at first I thought, um, so and then I was corrected and called, no, some of the presenters have images they want, and I, I just thought the only thing I would want to be true, and that's something that would probably be for me, because my mentality in tutoring is always uh, growth, and I mean, growth mindset is something that comes to mind a lot, but even less formally than that, just the atmosphere of encouraging students to constantly feel like they can do what, what they want to do. Um, but a big part of what that means for tutors is learning what I learned as a tutor, which is that students are wildly different. Them, right? So if somebody is tutoring, they usually like that subject a lot. And it's something that they think is like, well, I love it, they're going to love it, which is so far from the truth. When right? you're tutoring chemistry 103 and 104, you have somebody who is studying history and they hate every moment of that. Um, so what I talk to my tutors a lot about is, I mean, it's always empathy, but I don't just come out and say it's empathy. We talk about um, what it means to adapt to different students. So in the athletic department, we have a huge array of students. Um, and so, you know, we have a lot of students from on our football team who are from Georgia or Florida, um, and they've come from school systems that did not stress the value of education at all, and they've been very underserviced. So what is it like when I have somebody who's getting a, a PhD in chemistry or biomed, you know, chemistry, and then they're working with somebody who is probably struggling to read the text in their uh, English class, you know? So um, having to be able to adapt is really vital to me, so we're talking about that all the time. Um, but then I also stress the value of rapport building with tutors because um, you know if you you know you might have a student who comes in with like all right we had the ten things I want to talk about today let's go it's gonna be great you know that's a good experience for the tutor because it's easy but that's not always the experience that 
have. So you know, sometimes they are lengthy and we try to get those students engaged. So one of the other questions I'll ask in interviews is, all right, if a student is motivated, why might that be the case? And how could you amend that a little bit? Um, because I don't ever think it's tutors, a, a student's grade is not a tutor's responsibility, um, which is an interesting notion though, because when I applied for this job, the person interviewing me said, how much of a grade is a uh, tutor responsible for? And you know, I come from English where it's just all like, oh, come on, it's all about what you know, growing and all that. But you know, in that in that athletics you get to be like okay, they're just gonna be great, right? Um, and so what I was thinking of though when I answered that is, you know, if a tutor does the bare minimum of their job, they come in, they talk about content, they can teach that, they've done their job. But if they are doing that without flair, without engaging the student, without learning how to motivate them, they are missing out because a great tutor can do those things and a great tutor can help a student do better in a course by using those skills. So in a small sense, tutors can influence those grades, which um, again, I'm not I'm not from the world of athletics, so I'm not like this thing of hoping their GPAs are perfect. Um, I don't interact with coaches, so I don't really suffer if you know students are doing well, but of course I want the students to do well, that's what I'm all about. Um, and so talking to tutors a lot about that growth mindset is really vital. Um, and then also, as I said earlier, we have students who this is not their comfort zone at all, but I mean, I got my master's, I work in a college, I love academics, this is where I thrive, and being around people who are really smart like all of you and like growing and learning, that does a lot for me, but our students aren't always like that, and so that's one thing I caution our teachers to be aware of is, when they are here, they are at their most at risk, you know, like that's when I go to football games, I don't know what's going on, and I've drawn people like, you know, mm -hmm. on my side, like calling out, you know, yeah, it was great, it was terrible, like, I don't know what's happening, um, you know, so that, risk that I feel, that stress, that uncomfortability is what the students are feeling when they come in saying like, all right, I have to go to this tutor for this class that I don't care about, that I don't know anything about. And so I'm always looking to talk with tutors about ways to connect with students and make them, you know, not make them, we um, all of like, them see paths of possibility there that they can be better if they want it. They can take things small and get what they want out of the class. I don't know if that's my minute. I'm sorry if it was more. <laughs> so, and, and it brought up a few points that I thought were really cool, which was, how do we connect, because we're all experts in our area, and we love our content area too, how do we connect with our students who don't what we like? Or how do we build connections into their classes? Or remember that ally at the table that you had? How do we help them find allies or cohorts so that they can get through our courses? Thank you, Mark. Hi, Mark. It's the same problem that we had where who's the person who said, I never learned the patterns? Yeah. Like if you don't do the case study more than once, if every time is a new active learning thing, then every time they've got like, what are the rules now? What are the rules today? And then they're lost in this sort of chaos. So there's this balance space between, all right, I've done this before, I recognize this, I feel some comfort, I'm still not super comfortable with it, I'm not bored with it yet, but at least I recognize it versus I'll do every time. All right, so you've heard the introduction from all four of them, and you've gone through some traumatic experiences at your tables um, where you understand what it's like to meet up with people, the people around you, and understand what it's like to be humble because you don't know the rules that everyone else is playing by. What questions do you have?
there is a fine line between sympathy, empathy, and enabling certain behaviors. So where is that fine line, and how can I recognize and don't reinforce something that is not desirable because someone wants my empathy or sympathy or whatever? I don't ask her if she's taking advantage of us. Okay. <laughs> yeah, OK. Any ideas? Sorry, 
for an individual. And again, if you go back to the hashtag everyday academic ableism, or really just about any um, first person perspective on disability, the big message is we don't want your pity, we want access. And there was a great article in, um, I think I wanted to be taken. Anyway, it's a great, a great first person perspective of a wife of um, a husband who has quadriplegia. And she says, you know, she always has this conversation with her coworkers when she when they start talking about their families and they, when she, she knows when she mentions that her husband has quadriplegia, that the first thing will be, oh, I'm so sorry. And her statement is always, I don't really care about your I'm so sorry, you know, it's sweet. What I really want to know is, I want you to respect me and my husband as a valid marriage. And I want you to invite us to your house for dinner, just like you would any of your other coworkers. I want access and equality. And I think about that in terms of classrooms, too. That I think that the notion isn't, oh, I feel sorry for you, but back to the hashtags I was reading, you get a migraine. That might be nice and lovely, but really, I want equal access to the course, to the course uh, procedures, to the course materials, about the laptop thing, which is a whole other hobby horse I could get on, um, to the learning mechanisms. And so one of the ways that I really try to work in my own courses to ensure equal access is this notion of universal design that we talk about in terms of, I mean, it comes from uh, physical design issues. And the notion is that this building, it was built recently, and it, it is a model of universal design. There are both stairs for individuals who want to walk the stairs, and there's an elevator for individuals who want to use the elevator. And we don't stand in front of the elevator and say, can I see your documentation to be able to use this elevator? Or we don't say, oh, look, you just have like a sprained toe. I think you could walk two flights, but if two flights are not enough, you know, come back and I'll give you a, a documentation so that you can only have to walk one flight, and then you can take the elevator. Or we don't say, oh, I see you're pushing, pushing a stroller, but your baby's only X months old. You could carry your baby up the stairs. I mean, these things can get sillier and sillier and sillier, but the notion is that we don't gate keep in front of the elevator. We say, if you want to use the elevator, use the elevator. We say, if you want to use the stairs, use the stairs. Both will get you to where you want to go. And it's hard work, and I'm not sure I'm a master at it yet, but I try to use that same principle in my pedagogy to say, are there alternate ways to get where students need to go? And moreover, the piece that I want to bring back to empathy is I provide those routes, those alternate routes, to everyone. And so that it's not just segregating students with disabilities and saying, oh, you're the ones who get to use the elevator. Um, because we tend to also think of instructional accommodations, and sometimes they are, but they don't always have to be, like um, parking spaces. And so there's only X number of parking spaces in the parking lot. We're going to mark a few of them to be for people with disabilities, and then people start saying, oh, I would really like to have that, but I can't, blah, blah, blah. I tend to think of it more like elevators and stairs, where these are the two options or the, that I have in my class, and people can choose which options they want to go on, but I'm not gatekeeping because it's not a fixed sum. Anytime I run into something that's a fixed amount, like parking spaces, I'm trying to work around that so that I can have equal access and choice for my students. And it's, it's hard work. And I'm not sure I'm always successful, but that's that's my kind of guiding principle. So multiple options and open to everybody. Maybe be open to everyone. I'll just to follow up, also on the infographic, you'll see data we collect on the campus about fairness. And the irony is that some of the accommodations, like sign language and Braille, which, by the way, are some of the most expensive accommodations on this campus, everyone thinks is imminent, that are eminently fair. But when you start talking about extended time or flexibility and need for deadlines or flexibility in attendance, the fairness ratings drop to, on our scale, a three, which means it's not necessarily fair, but it's not necessarily unfair. And that's good, at least they're not down in the unfair range. But I think that's, that's a heads up for us to say, if we're giving that accommodation on the front, we really could be building in some inequities and some stigma for our students who do need it. And 
And so think of ways that we can build equal access even to some of those high stakes instructional accommodations. And if you have a question, you can type down Sue or myself, and we will come to you with the microphone. <laughs> um, I, I have a question. I highly suggest you tell me your classes and uh, teach language and the classes can be quite small. Um, but where there's a student who I feel has potentially a language learning disability or another kind of learning disability, and I want to accommodate that student as much as possible, but I don't want to help that student. I don't want to help that student. So, what are your guidelines? There's a lot more experience with people than me, um, and I'd love to hear about the situation and what ways, what university resources, what sort of personal accommodations do you use to deal with the situation? So, I can just quickly talk a little bit about the things that I do in my own classroom, because I also feel like I could probably have a learning disability of some sort if we all learn in different ways. I do try to provide opportunities for students to learn um, through visual, audio, they can document things on Canvas. I try to use different ways for each student to have an opportunity to succeed on the same topic. Um, so, so, so I always have like videos that they can respond to, or um, if they have, I, I know a lot of students don't like to talk in class, so I give them another opportunity to be reflective. I always have reflective reflections. Um, and so we also are very project based, so I always break it out into ways that help us to succeed in one way versus another. Um, so for me, it's just more about giving them different opportunities and different perspectives. Absolutely. Um, the pod and, and, and um, accentuate what Leslie said because if I'm following your question, I mean, my notion might be well, should I refer them somewhere where, for example, they might get a McBurney visa? And if they get the McBurney visa, it's going to come back to you asking you to do exactly what Leslie just said, which is to provide a multiple opportunities for the students to demonstrate their mastery or to participate in class. I mean, you, you really found a pretty hyperverbal student, and um, but I went to a large state university, and it was only when I got to graduate school that I realized, wow, I mean, I could just totally ace this. These are all just seminars. All I had to do was just sit around in a group of 10 people and just talk all the time. This is extraordinary. Um, but um, there are other students who are like, oh my goodness, I'm gonna have to sit in a group of 10 people and talk for two hours. That's a huge, that's, that's, that's going to be very difficult. The notion being that providing multiple ways to demonstrate mastery and making those provisions open to everyone, which is the notion of universal design, it's hard. It's hard work. I mean, it's much easier to say, come and talk for two hours and I'm going to grade you on how much you talk, or come take the 65 item multiple choice test for your final exam and if you're not a good multiple choice test taker that's your problem it's much easier to do the, throw one type of assessment since we're talking assessment at students than to provide multiple opportunities but the multiple opportunities are the ones that uh, will allow students with very different backgrounds and i'll just mention one other thing you know, I, I drilled down about the set about the documentation. We also know there's huge economic disparities in who gets disability documentation, and huge because it takes time and money to do so. And so, as a way to to, to I would say sidestep, but to work around those disparities, opening up your classroom and providing multiple avenues for demonstrating mastery is, I think, a winning ticket. So students know more about their mastery? Absolutely. Well, we know, you know, I mentioned that we know that only about half the students on this campus are registered with McBurney. <clears throat> we know that um, one of the groups that's severely under-registered are our veterans, and that our veterans really have a tendency to see a lot of stigma 
with being registered with the firm. And so they'll just gut it out and try to struggle through. We also see that there are cultural differences that, you know, usually before to be blunt here, upper middle class, white families will encourage, you know, encourage people to get documentation. And we don't see that in other um, from other um, segments we say. So a way to kind of say if they I mean in your head to say, if they had the documentation from Mick Bernie, what would I be doing? Well I would be providing multiple opportunities because that's what your documentation will ask you to do. I might just do that. I'll just I'll just skip ahead of that step and I'll make it accessible. I'll make that those opportunities available to everyone so that we don't have this perceived fairness and inequity, which, you know, I guess, um, again, hyperverbal, and I think probably my first full utterance was, because I grew up in two older brothers, you know, that's not fair. I think a lot about equity, and I want to make sure our classrooms are equitable environments. Martin, I mentioned that it's a lot of hard work, and I want to quickly share a tip, and that is, if you have a final project, um, say, of a paper, say, all right, do a paper or something else, have a rubric thing, that, but have them come up with an idea because somebody might take advantage of that. And then the next semester, now you've got the paper and this other thing. And the third semester, you've got three different options and another thing. And the fourth, you know, and eventually you can start having all kinds of different opportunities for the students to um, try the things out. Right, we do need you in a moment, but back to So I kind of wanted to build on that. Um, I work with students in the medical school, and so I'm wondering, and with professional students, um, there are some things that at least are perceived to be requirements of the job. Um, and so when a student maybe needs accommodations around something that's perceived to be like, no, this is the requirement, this is the way that it has to be done, um, even if I want to accommodate them, I don't always know how to do that. And if I can figure out how to do it, then I also need to get buy-in from a really large group of clinical faculty that doing something differently than we've done it in medicine for the past 100 years is okay to at least try for this student. And so I'm wondering if you guys have any thoughts around the job requirements for professional students. Um, yeah, I think it's a tip. Your, your point about the buy-in is huge. And there is this notion of, you know, the way we've always taught, it's, I'll just use the example from my part, the way we've always taught intro psych is that it's three 50-minute exams. And they're all multiple choice, and that's the only way we're going to do it. And um, that's just a trivial example. When you're talking about professional examples, and I think about, for example, um, blocking in his first name, um, Cordis, who, uh, <laughs> as you probably know, um, a, um, I think, from the Tim, thank you, thank you so much, Tim Cordis, who you um, know, med school was the only med school who accepted him. He was valedictorian at um, Notre Dame, and he's an individual who's blind. And UW Med School was the only med school who accepted him um, with stellar grades and stellar recommendations. And for those of you who worked with Tim, you know it took some work. I mean, you know, we, we have a blind person doing anatomy. How are we going to do the section, et cetera? And some of the, the things that they developed, I mean, this is, I'm sure, a glorified story, but some of the things that they developed are now used for everyone. So, for example, some of the auditory cues for dissection turned out to be a multiple pathway for learning, and it was wonderful. Um, but there is that, 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 that barrier that you just described, which is the sense that we've always done it this way, and if you can't do it this way, you don't belong in this field. Um, I'm old enough to remember that when I went to the University of Oregon as an assistant professor, I was only the second woman assistant professor, or professor, that they had ever hired. And their building was one, this is a fun at Universal Design, their building was an old retrofitted dorm. And so in the old fashioned dorm where there's like a community bathroom that only one on every floor. And so when they retrofitted the, the, the building, they made the lower, um, the restroom on the lower level to um, uh, be, uh, they built an additional, sorry, they built an additional restroom on the lower level because that's where the classes were. And they imagined that they would have women come into classes. But all of the floors above the lower level where the classrooms were were men only bathrooms. 
And so when they hired their first woman faculty member, they actually trans, uh, changed one bathroom to be a woman's bathroom. So she had to go up to the sixth floor to go to the bathroom every time. When I came and they told me about that, I was like, seriously, I have to go to the sixth floor every time I want to go to the restroom. And other side was like kind of scratching their heads thinking about it. Skip forward to every building that we build on this campus now, we would never consider not having a women's restroom. Moreover, we might have a family restroom. We might have a changing station. We might have a place for, for women to breastfeed or to pump or any of these things. Point being that at the University of Oregon, they said this is the way we've always done it. Women faculty had to go up to the sixth floor. You, you, you should do that. We need to get around that this is the way we've always done it to that might be the way we've always done it. I, mean, I grew up in the segregated South. My high school was desegregated by court order my junior year. And that's another one of those, this is the way we've always done it kinds of thing. Very extreme, much more extreme than the situation that you're talking about. But the, this is the way we've always done it or this is what's required can sometimes be an artifact of history. Okay, I think we can fit in one more quick question, and John has got up the mic, and then through you respect work time, we're going to let you go. So you, you talk about different kinds of assessment, and I certainly that that not the one I'm trying to do. <laughs> so I can only see one type of assessment for assignment, but I have lots of different assignments that have different types of assessments in them. And I'm not quite sure how I would ever fit in different kinds of products coming in from students within a particular assignment because I always get to say, well, how is that fair to somebody else? And I don't know that I could actually do that, even with group, I'm not quite sure. It sounds like you have different kinds of assignments. You're not yes. saying, for example, my prototypic intro sign, which is your entire grade is going to be based on your performance during three 15-minute periods for an entire semester. And I'm saying that kind of in a mocking way, but I don't think our intro science class is that different from other large introductory classes. But you're saying that you have, a, you have variability among your assignments, your assignment, but each one is comes in that flavor. Yeah. Only. Yeah. And you don't have any problem with that. You have multiple assignments, so it's, they're a little safe. So even if I'm really terrible at one assignment, that's not going to help me. So I have opportunities like, to do better in other mediums and what I'll be saying is the lowest stake. Well, all right. <laughs> they're super important. Uh, they're, they're less lowest stake than... Six or seven hundred point assignments, okay? And then I'll be Thank you all for coming today.